Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship, whether you're joining us here or online. Uh, today we have a gratitude moment. One is for uh, yesterday's events, the family festival. We had the dedication of uh, the labyrinth and all went well. And I'm really grateful for all who volunteered and worked. And some of them are actually here. I thought I you know, we'd miss them today because they worked so hard. But it was it was great fun, and we're grateful for the joy of celebrating with families in our community. But the labyrinth I want to share with you is that it will it is open. Uh, it'll be open Sundays, 8:30 to 12. So following worship, you may go and uh, enjoy walking the labyrinth. There are instructions on how to do it, and if there are others, that's all right. Don't feel like you can't go in, you know, because it's kind of a metaphor for life. We're not ever on the journey alone. And so if somebody is trying to pass, you can just pass them and get back to your spot. So it's, it's okay to go in. So we hope that you will take advantage of it. And whether you do it today or another day, uh, it will be here for us. And when we fold it, it will be also in the parlor. So if you feel strong enough, you want to walk it, you can just pull it and open it and then fold it, put it back up. So it will be here for all of us. Did some, you walked it this morning. Did anybody else walk it so far? Yeah. So how'd it go? I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I hope it was good. <laughs> it was good, good. Uh, today, oh, we have a couple of joys. One is there's a birthday in the house. Yay. So Peggy, it's her birthday. Yeah, it's, birthday. Yes, so happy birthday, Peggy. And Tom, is it okay if I put you on the spot? Lauren. Oh, Lauren's birth. Yes, Lauren, Lauren. Okay, happy birthday, Lauren. Mateo's? Oh, no, not yet. We got it confused. I got it confused. It, he was actually born in May. I, well, I got to correct that. Yes, but, but it is a joy because uh, Mateo is getting baptized on Thursday here. So, but I got it confused because it was because of the, na the Matthew, you know, so the name of um, the saint. And so that's the whole connection. Uh, but Tom, do you want to say anything about tomorrow? A little surgery. Yeah. Prayers for Cindy? <laughs> well, we'll, we'll... Back surgery, so we'll pray for you. All right, so today we continue the sermon series, uh, Our World in Stories. We began last week. Uh, and we were looking at this, imp the importance of stories. And this is based on a book by Mark Iaconelli, Between the Listening and the Telling, the importance of stories. And he talks about, you know, how our worlds, uh, we live by certain stories, but then sometimes our story falls apart, you know, due to death or loss or change in career or health or any, any issues in life. But then new stories emerge, and sto stories help us to find our center in life and our connection to others. So today, the focus is on connecting to others, uh, that stories bind us together. 
think about it when you get together with family members or if you go to a school reunion or you see someone you haven't seen for a long time. One of the things we do is what? Reminisce. We remember when, and it's always interesting to me because you know, we've lived those experiences. Why do we talk about them again? They kind of bring us back to that sense of connection, you know, especially as if you have the uh, privilege of having siblings, you talk about your parents. And remember when they did this to us? Or we did this to them and they didn't know. There were those stories too. But there is power in those, in those stories because they do connect us in a way that uh, is just beyond the, the surface stuff that we do with others. And so I want to share with you today a, a little clip from a writer who wrote a book called See No Strangers, um, or See No Stranger. Uh, her name is Valerie Kaur, and she uh, wrote about this idea of revolutionary love. And the idea is to really connect with others. And she was, uh, her family and her friends were victims of uh, violence after 9-11 because uh, they were Sikhs, and the Sikhs uh, wore those turbans, and people confused Muslims and Sikhs. And she talked about, you know, the, the pain that the whole community experienced because of the violence against them with the, with the fear of uh, Muslims. And so uh, she, she found that to be motivational for her to experience new ways of loving and bringing people together. So this is just a little interview with her and we'll watch, and I, I find it to be very powerful. Life experiences. See no stranger. That is a core principle anchoring the Revolutionary Love Project. It's a model designed by civil rights activist and author Valerie Kaur for reimagining a better community. Your TED Talk has inspired millions around the world as well as your best-selling book, See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love. Valerie, great to see you here. Thank you, Patrick. I'm delighted to be here with you. Well, I got to see you in action uh, with your TED Talk just the other day. You've been on campus. You are spreading the word about See No Stranger, and it's born out of a compass yes. that you created. Walk us through this and how it is that we can better see each other and understand each other mm. and have better conversations. Mm. Well, it begins with a core practice. It begins with wonder. So I know that as a mama, I have to wonder about my babies every day in order to figure out how to care for them. I mean, they're changing so fast. So what do you need? What do you, what do you want? And I realize that love is more than just a rush of feeling. Love, love is sweet labor. It's fierce and bloody, imperfect, demanding. It's a choice we make again and again. So what might happen if we take a little bit of that way of loving out into the world? What if we express that kind of love for others, for even our opponents, and for ourselves, who we too often neglect? And what I discovered in the process of writing this book was that the core of love was wonder. So the practice is this, and you all can do it with me. When you're walking down the street and you're looking at faces on the screen, on the street, or on the subway, you can say in your mind, sister, brother, sibling, beloved. And when you are doing that, you are retraining your eye to see all others as kin. Now, it sounds so simple, but we all carry unconscious bias within us. Within a split second, before conscious thought, our minds decide who is one of them and who is one of us. And in this country, racial hierarchies most determine that line. So when you are saying sister, brother, sibling, you're retraining your eye to see no stranger. It is a powerful anti-racist practice because who we see as one of us determines whose pain we let into our heart, who we choose to help, whose grief we share, what policies we support, and what leaders we elect. Demagogues succeed in dehumanizing entire groups of people when they successfully shut down our collective imagination. So wondering about one another, opening ourselves to each other's stories, grieving with each other, and ultimately fighting for each other is how we practice seeing no stranger.
we're done for the day. <laughs> she said it so beautifully. It's, it's really an, an, an incredible practice when you think about it. I mean, just look around this room and think, sister, brother, someone that you're connected to, you may not know them. And she sa says something that really speaks to me is that uh, when you see someone, you say, this is the part of me that I don't know yet. Uh, so they're a part of me that I just don't know uh, yet. And, and she talks about experiences of many times where she encountered people who were racist or hateful. And like in a restaurant, these two people were talking about all this horrible stuff about other races. And then she's like, ah, I don't want to practice this revolutionary love anymore. But then she pushed herself to connect, to ask them questions, to wonder about what is going on with them. And so that's kind of the practice of sharing stories. It's not uh, you know, to just dig deep into somebody's life, but to really wonder about who they are, what made them who they are, how did they get to this point? And so I want to uh, hopefully invite us th today to uh, wonder about that in our own personal lives. Do you know the stories of people around you, the people you encounter, especially the people you don't like? or you're fearful of, or the people that you know, kind of push your buttons, uh, whether it's whole groups of people, and that's really good. We are so good at doing that, whole groups of people, the whatever, and then we, we label them as this group that we don't really want to know about because we already know about them. So I invite us to pray today, and the prayer today is kind of a reflective, uh, psalm that is uh, a video and I invite you to kind of um, let go and be present to this moment. My soul is for your blessing, for you are very great. Clothed with light and splendor, wrapped in light like a garment. Who stretches out the sky like a curtain, whose roof beams are fashioned with the waters, whose chariots are the clouds, who walks along the wind's wings, whose messengers are the winds, Whose ministers are fires, flames, who sets the earth upon her foundations so that she cannot be moved, and covers her with waters like a robe. The waters stood high above the mountains, and with your blast they fled. Hearing your thunder, they rushed away, ascending the mountains pouring into the valleys until they found the place you'd set aside for them, holding them within their borders, that they not return to engulf the earth, who make springs gush forth from the hills, so that between the hills brooks run clear, giving drink to the roaming animals, there the deer come to slake their thirst. There the waterfowl nest, sending out their voices from between the nearby branches. You water the mountains from your lofts, satisfy the earth with the fruits of your labor, cause grasses to grow for the cattle and herbs to respond to a human touch so that people can bring forth crops from the land and wine to gladden their hearts and oil to make their faces glisten and bread to sustain them. Full of sap are your trees, the cedars of Lebanon that you have planted, where the birds make their nests, the heron has her home in the junipers. The high mountains are for wild goats. The cliffs a shelter for marmots. You made the moon for the seasons. Made the 
the sun that knows when to set. You cause darkness to ripen into night, so that the night animals feel moved to stir. The young lions to roar for their prey, asking you for their food. And when the sun comes up, they return quietly home crowd to sleep in their dens. Then people go out to do their work, and they labor until evening. How various are these deeds that you have performed so shapely. The earth so full of your riches. Here is the vast, wide sea in which creatures without number of all sizes and kinds, crawl and swim or drift and wave. There the great ships make their voyages, and huge whales journey and breach without tiring. All these wait upon you to give them their food in due season. What you give, they gather. You open your hand and they are satisfied. Hide your face and they vanish. Remove your breath and they perish. Return to the dust they were made from. Breathe again your breath and they enter life renewed. Refreshing the face of the earth. Your glory endures forever. Your work is an endless rejoicing. You who glance at the earth and she trembles, who touch the mountains and they smoke. While I live, my songs will be for you. While I am, I'll speak my gratefulness. May my words be agreeable. Yes, I will share your rejoicing. May all that denies you be denied. And all that demeans you pass. My soul is for your blessing. I praise that too. Amen. It's hard to speak after something like this. It's like, oh, I watched it a couple of days ago, and then now I watched it again. It's like, wow. It really speaks about God's glory and creation and all of God's people and all the different aspects of our lives. And so today, as we speak about this idea of storytelling or sharing our stories, it's really an invitation for us to really connect authentically to who we are. Because sometimes we tell stories you know, that are tall tales, you know, or we try to pretend to be something else or someone else, or we sometimes alienate ourselves from our core stories. But uh, at the heart of it, when we are authentic, when others are authentic and sharing those stories, we feel a deep connection instead of the normal judgments we put upon ourselves or others. And so today I want to begin with a story from Mark Iaconelli. He founded something, we'll watch a video a little bit later about it. He founded a community called The Hearth, a storytelling community. And this was something he envisioned because he started noticing how important stories are to bring people together. And so this was early on and they were uh, having a storytelling event. And there were six people who were lined up to speak, to tell their stories. So six ordinary people. And the theme, they were given a theme. So the theme was wilderness tales. 
So one of the people was struggling with crafting her story, and she wanted to meet with him to help her you know, put the story together. So he said, OK, well, tell me, what have you come up with? And she was telling a story about a cross-country kind of canoe trip. And so she wanted to tell him the details of it. And as he sat and listened, it was just so boring. He, she was talking about a canoe trip from, from Oregon to Michigan. And he said it was like a postcard picture, one after the other. He, he felt like he was being forced to watch, to watch somebody else's uh, family vacation videos. Have you ever had those experiences where people are wanting to show you, well, let me show you. Like, oh, OK, thank you. I mean, some of it is interesting, but then when they, it goes on and on, or grandparents are guilty of that, let me show you 100 pictures of my grandchild. Um, you can do that with me anytime, by the way. But <laughs> who does that? No, never. <laughs> we never do that. But see, <laughs> even you know, you know. And so he said it as he sat and listened to her. He was just so bored, and he was grasping for something important for her to share. And he said, just nothing happened. It was just this Oregon coast experience, and how beautiful, and there were waterfalls and. Uh, rain and experiences. You want to tell us about your, your recent trip? It's gorgeous. It's, it's beautiful. But, you know, if somebody's just describing it in detail, he was saying it was such uh, boring stuff. So he said there was nothing that happened in the story. It was just nothing. And so he was, uh, he was asking her, so tell me more. So she had traveled with her fiance uh, at that point. I mean, she, this is older in her life, but she had traveled with her fiance because he wanted to, uh, he wanted her to meet his parents in Michigan. And so they were in Oregon. And he said, well, why don't we canoe uh, our way there? And then, you know, we can, you can meet the family. And so she agreed with him. And went on this journey. And he said, you know, so you got there and, you know, I'm assuming you met the family. Oh yeah, we had a great time. By the time we, you know, passed through all these challenges, we had a great time and, you know, I met his family and everything really went very well. And he said, and so you got married after that. And she said, oh, no. <laughs> Why? What happened? And this is, I love this. Um, I love this, this line because she said, it was because of the hamburger. I wanted the hamburger and he said no. <laughs> and he goes, oh, tell me more about the hamburger. And that's when he said the story got interesting. And she said she came from a long line of uh, women being abused, generational abuse. And so she had no background of, of speaking up and telling her mind and sharing what she wanted and she desired. When he proposed the, the idea of going on a canoe trip, she did not want to do it. It was the, the last thing she would have wanted, but she said yes because that was what was expected out of her. And she said, so as they were traveling and going through difficulties, she started feeling physically stronger, of course, when you're canoeing and doing all of this. And so they met a man who told them about a hamburger restaurant in Mississippi. And he said, it's the best hamburger you'll ever have. And so she wanted a hamburger. And so she said I, that it took a lot of courage for her to express her desire for, for something she wanted, because he wasn't interested in that. And so he agreed when she said, I want a hamburger. When we get there, I, I want to get this hamburger. So as they were getting close, even though he had said yes, he said, no, we don't have time for that. We're not going to get a hamburger. And that was the moment for her when she decided, I'm going to leave this man no matter what it takes. And it was a big deal for her. So as they, she spoke and was telling this to Mark Iaconelli, he encouraged her, this is the heart of your story. This is the heart of who you are. And this is the story you need to tell. And so when the evening came, she had invited her children to come and join and, and be in the audience of listening to this story. And this is how she opened it. There were three rules passed down from the women in my family. One, a man will always be the captain of your life. Two, your needs will always be subordinate to his needs. Three, don't rock the boat. You can imagine as she told, and then she continued to tell her story, you can imagine as she told the story how 
powerful the connection she made with her own uh, children, with the audience, people really getting to know her and to know why she chose the career she chose and who she became as a person, and being able to uh, to go, you know, from you know a, a picture book story to really a life story that connects her to others, and especially dealing with generational abuse of, of women. Very different kind of story. And so you can see this as an example of what connects us to others. And you can see the power of stories that we normally tell, like the easy, simple, surface stories. But when we tell heart stories, when we tell you know, about who we are, what brought us to this moment, it's very different. It's a very different connection with others. Um, so thinking about it, you know, we had a little incident last night. Uh, to give you a, t a, a surface story from my life, this is, you know, typical. I, and I was thinking about that. I'm like, yeah, I'm really good at telling a lot of surface stories. I'm comfortable with that. But we had, uh, I was getting relaxed to go to sleep, and then I heard this zzzz. <laughs> Horrified, there was a big wasp. In the, in the bedroom, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna sleep, so I start screaming, I covered my head. <laughs> and Mike is like, please, God, what is this? <laughs> and so we're, you know, and then he's like, oh, I killed it, and then I get, okay, all right, he killed it, I get out, and then I hear the buzz again, he didn't kill anything, it's still here! <laughs> and then he's, he's getting mad at that point, because <laughs> the volume was really high, you know. I'm not doing it justice because I was really terrified. And, and then, he's, then he swears he killed it. I'm like, oh, that's it. I'm going to sleep in the guest bedroom. That was the end, I mean, to me. But to talk about maybe the deeper stuff of life, why am I so scared of this stuff? I grew up in a place in, in the world, in Syria. There were tons of bugs. And, there were, and I, was, I was, you know, teased all the time as a child about this fear that I had. And so it's, there's a lot of stuff that's unresolved there for me. And even though I'm an adult and I can try to infuse some logic into it, there's a lot of the childhood stuff that we carry with us. So you can see the difference between a story that's, you know, just the surface makes you laugh. Oh, yeah, we had a, a, a wasp in the bedroom. Not a big deal. But then when you talk about your own background and you know, having to worry about you know, flying cockroaches and stuff like that and, and being teased about it and talking about the feelings that came with that, that's a whole different story for us. And so today we're looking at a Bible passage and it may at, seem, at first seem like it's not connected to the theme, but it is because it is helping people uh, understand the differences, that differences are really the surface stuff. So when we look at people, uh, we often look at the differences. You know, somebody has short hair, I have long hair. Somebody is tall, somebody's short, somebody's black, somebody's white. Somebody does this or does that, or whatever we, we look at and judge. Somebody has children, somebody doesn't have children. Uh, you think about the differences, but when you start telling stories, you start going deeper. You start connecting to stuff like we all can connect to. So you may not have a fear of bugs, or you may not have been abused as a woman, as in the story of, of this woman in Mark's book. But you can relate to being teased. You can relate to not finding your voice, speaking your truth whatever the circumstance might be in your own life, and having to succumb to the pressures of others. Whether it's, think about it in a job you're, you might have had, where you had to live up to certain expectations and follow the culture, even though it may not have been in alignment with your own soul. So Paul, the Apostle Paul in the scripture for today from 1 Corinthians, is dealing with conflict. So people were looking at differences normal story is that, you know, there were divisions in the church. Some, they had different teachers uh, that came, and so some called themselves, you know, we're followers of Apollos. We don't like, you know, we're followers of Paul. We're followers of Christ. So there were divisions. And you can, you can translate that in your own life or in our world t today. Think about it, you know. Who did you vote for the last election? And I will split the room right away. <laughs> what do you think? If you turn to your neighbor and they tell you they voted for the other person, 
don't you start judging? You're like, oh, how could you? And then you go, you go into the rant of why this was a terrible choice. And so he was in that place. They were, they were writing him and asking for his advice. Or maybe he had heard about it and decided to write them a letter to say, you know, I got to set the record straight here to help them. So this is in Corinth. And I don't know if you're interested, but Corinth was a city that was competing with Rome. So you could see Corinth is down here and Rome was there. And Corinth was wanting to be the next Rome. So they were wanting to outdo. And competition became such an important part of the culture. You know, you had to outdo or uh, be greater in the buildings, the culture, and all of that. And there was part of it was the imperial cult. So the imperial cult was, they didn't, of course, call it a cult because they thought it was a good thing. Uh, no one, in, in, by the way, no one in a cult says, I'm in a cult. Um, they always say it's, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. It's the right way. And so what they saw is that, you know, the way of the emperor, the way of the empire was the way to live, power, you know, um, security, esteem, culture, making the city really, and at the same time, there were poor people, there were people who were neglected, but they didn't care because they were, the competition was the most important part. And so they struggled over time, and the ch that was splitting the church. There were competitions of who was going to get to the table of Christ first. So maybe the rich people, the, those who donated more, were going to get served first. You know, after all, they're putting in more into it. Or the people who served more. So there was a lot of stuff going on in the, in behind the scenes in, when we read these, uh, these words shortly from 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 12. And so uh, it's interesting that he appeals to that same spirit, the, sa the overarching story of Christ for them. So reminding them of the original story. So he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, because they had debates. You know, somehow I'm better than you because I have... I have the ability to speak in tongues, or I have the ability to heal, but you don't. So there were tests. Who would be, uh, yes, it is, oh, I thought he was going back because the music is inviting him, whatever that uh, choo-choo train is inviting. Uh, so there was that division. So he says, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to a, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. For as in one body we have many parts, and oh, sorry, I, I skipped to the next scripture. So uh, he used the same method in many of his letters, reminding people that it's, it's the same story. We have, I mean, when you look underneath all of each culture, and not to belittle, and, and I, I'm not saying that each culture is the same, but at the core of it, as human beings, we hurt, we need food, we need shelter, we need the basics of life, we need affection and love. I mean, that's, that's the whole human story. And Paul is saying, you know, you have the same story. At the end of it, it's the same spirit that is within each person. This divine spirit is in you and in, in your enemies or the people you're fighting with in the church. Think about how difficult that is to accept. Kind of like back to what Valerie Kaur said, sister, brother, you know, looking and seeing, yes, oh, uh, Lisa has the utterance of wisdom, but I have something else and it's for the common good. It's it's all used for the common good. So that's, that was his method of dealing with it. And he goes into the same kind of argument, the church in Rome. It was a different conflict because it was between Gentiles and Jews. 
both followers of Jesus, but they were competing also for leadership. And so it seems like a, a common human theme, again, competing for who wants to, the recognition, who wants uh, the power. So he says, for as in one body, we have many members and not all the members have the same function. So we, ha we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members of one, uh, one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. So each is valuable, reminding that each has a story. Each has a story, but the overarching story is what brings us together. So there's the, that piece uh, that today I, I think of not just the story of each person in your life, but think of the stories that circulate in a community. What are the stories we live by in our community? Uh, and think when you highlight so much, the media always highlighting something that, that happened that's so bad. But when we highlight the good stuff, I love, I love living in a small area where, you know, they come to little events and they highlight that, you know, so there was someone that made a really good pumpkin uh, pie or something like that. I mean, you know, you hear things like that. Like yesterday we had uh, the press here for our little labyrinth and family festival. Very interested in that. And, you know, if you lived in a big city, you, none of this would be highlighted because you're just, everybody has so many things going on. But when we look at these stories of goodness each day, and when we celebrate them and highlight them, we tell a different story. And especially stories of resilience, stories where people overcome challenges. And that's, these are harder because again, we like to tell the stories that are easy to tell, but the hard stories are really where the gold is. And so Paul, of course, knew the stories of the people, what they were struggling with, but he was calling for a different kind of sharing, for a deeper kind of sharing. Remember, remember who you are in Christ. You know, it's the same spirit, yes. Different gifts, different ways of dealing with things. Uh, what I like versus what you like, or how we uh, do things. If somebody else was standing here and speaking, they would do this whole sermon very differently. And that's all right. There's not one person that's better than the other in, in their sharing. And so calling ourselves back to seeing differences as ways to help us. Uh, to, and, and I personally, as a, as a pastor, I often hear this when talking to people about spiritual gifts. So we're calling someone to serve in a ministry. And oftentimes, this is, this is the line I hear. I don't know what my gifts are for ministry. Why would I be chosen to do this? I have nothing to offer. Or am I really equipped to do this? Do you ever hear that about yourself? I mean, it could be in, not just in a context of ministry, it could be in life. When you get an opportunity or you feel nudged to do something, there are hindrances that come up for us. But the difference is that when we start and say, well, tell me about your life. What have you done? Where, where, what has led you to this? And as we start sharing stories and hearing about the person's life, I'm like, wow, you have so many gifts. What are you talking about? God has prepared you. You have so much to share because it's not about qualifications. See, we sometimes think that gifts are about qualifications. Who I am is about how much wealth I accumulated or how much power or how much skill. It's about the experiences of the spirit in your life. So it's about the deeper stuff. You have what it takes to live a life of grace. You have, and the other person the same way, they've had hardships. Nobody here in this room or anywhere in any community that I know of has been spared the experiences of loss, of illness, of heartache, of challenge, of fear all the, the human experiences, and some have it harder than others. But all of us have something to share because we've all weathered those storms somehow, or we've had people that come in our lives and help us and, and walk us through this. So each of us has the ability to share that, that faith. It's about the invitation though to be able to share those deeper things in life and to prepare communities to do that.
So I want to share with you, uh, b before we do that, any thoughts, reactions? Because I talked a lot. <laughs> any of this connecting for you? Yes, yeah? I feel like I need any of this today. Okay. You want to tell us more? Or not, you're good. There's power there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. Wow, what a blessing to have that ability. When we hear someone else's story and someone else's struggle, it blesses us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Bonnie. I think that is if, if we are brave enough mm. to take that first step. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it does take um, effort, bravery, whatever it is. It's an unknown that we're mm -hmm. stepping into. Mm -hmm. um, and and you think, well, I should, I should do this. It's you know, it's helpful in the community. Mm -hmm. And then we end up being the one that mm -hmm. as blessed or more. Right. Right. But it takes. The, I like that word you said, bravery. You know, being brave. It's getting out of our fears because we feel like we're gonna get shunned if we say what we've experienced in our lives and what we struggle with because we all have these deep struggles it's just part of the human experience and that's why we need god's grace yeah anyone else okay so what we'll share is uh, what i'm going to share is a video from this group as i said mark agnelli has founded it's called the hearth and so uh, they, they established this in 2010, and they've been bringing people together. And they, had, they started out with just like, it would have 70, 80 people, but now they have hundreds of people that gather to share. And it's usually about sharing in the community. I'm actually curious because I, I just signed up to take one of their uh, workshops. They have a free Zoom workshop. And I'm curious what, how they do it in their community and how they have really uh, tried to go around the country to help people overcome those barriers and by sharing stories. So we'll watch this video together. There's a freshness in local community energy it just feels so good. It's moving, it's beautiful, it's inspiring. It doesn't feel like entertainment. It feels like I'm getting to really know some people. It just gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. The hearth started in a pub, and it's grown from about 80 people meeting in that pub to we average about 350 to 400 people on a night when we gather folks together. We have live music, we have a nonprofit, 
that we highlight, and then we tell stories that are connected to that nonprofit, so that there's a connection between stories and action, between a community gathering and having their compassion stimulated and cultivated, and real action that serves the common good. We're people that responded in a way that we knew how, which was just simply to offer whatever it is that we could do in a time of need. I always remember mom and dad telling us, you don't know how lucky you are. Count your blessings, you know, and share. And I can make a difference. And I think that standing here before all of you, I am already making a difference. Thank you. We as an audience are usually on the edge of our seats because it is so real. I find myself understanding issues in a different way, understanding my community in a different way, and thinking about myself in a different way after uh, coming to a hearth event and hearing stories. The hearth is trying to tap into the transformational nature of storytelling. How do stories change the way I feel about myself, the way I feel about my neighbors, the way I feel about my community? How does it draw out the deeper aspects of who I am, my generosity, my kindness, my creativity? That's where you start to get to the power of storytelling, and that's the element that the hearth knows how to work with. To me, it feels like it's building community in a very effective way, and there's a sense of all of us together doing this work. No matter where we are and what culture we grew up in, at the end of the day, there's a certain aspect of humanity that we all have, and I think this kind of rekindles that spirit in me. This is something that just gives me hope. You are well. So it just, it's a really powerful tool when you think about it. And, and when you think about, I would, I, when I listen to the people sharing, the words of the Apostle Paul were coming to me saying, you know, it's the same spirit. It is the same spirit. It, we have many gifts. We have a variety of experiences, but it is the same spirit. We are connected by the virtue of being created in the image of God. So I, I want to leave you with this question. How have authentic stories changed your life? Again, authentic stories meaning deeper stories, your family's life or your community's life. And maybe they haven't, and maybe it is a call for us to think, could we do something like this in our community? Can you do something like this in your own family? Have you uh, asked your own people and your own families to tell you those stories? Or have you met a stranger that you are curious about? How could you smile on the corner of a street and be in, you know, like a person that we should be crying or hopeless. So consider this question, and while you consider it, consider with it the words of the Apostle Paul. It is the same spirit, it is the one spirit that is underneath all of it. So I wanna invite us to today to come to this great story of God's love. This table of grace, it tells a story and that's the power of it, is that it is a story of openness, of welcome, of embrace, of abundance, of uh, eternal connections, while people bringing their hearts, who they are, to this table. And so we remember the story of Jesus, we remember the story of uh, his disciples coming together, and at the same time we remember that he was remembering the stories of his people, because this was a feast that they experienced, they practiced, to remind them of the stories that were meaningful about salvation, about love, about redemption, about healing from brokenness. And so today I pray that it will be for you all of these things, or at least one of those things, wherever you are needing it, whatever you are needing to experience in your life for this table, whatever part of the story that needs to connect with you today. So let's take a moment to pray. God, we give you thanks for this table, for meeting us at this place, at this time, at this uh, juncture in our lives. Help us today as we experience your grace, as we come to your table, to open our hearts to you, to open our lives, our minds, to the stories of your love manifested in our brothers and sisters all over the world. Let's, let this table be a reminder of how you brought strangers together and made them friends. 
that they were willing to give their lives for this story of love. Bless these elements and bless us that we may experience the fullness of your presence and love today to bring healing and wholeness wherever we have brokenness or fear. We pray this in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so friends, we remember that on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and after giving thanks to God, he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed it and gave it to them, reminding them that he was not going to drink from it until he would drink again with them in the kingdom of heaven. And so the great story of our faith is that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the same story of God's love for each one of us. So I invite you to come forward and receive these gifts. You may uh, take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup or take a, a communion cup and uh, partake where you, when you return to your uh, table or to your seat or you can stand here and receive these gifts. There is a gluten-free option in the little uh, cup, but also this is gluten-free as well. So come for all is ready. This is the table of Christ's love for us.
and we give thanks. God, we give you thanks for this feast of your love and pray that we may live by its wisdom. Help us to live by this story of love. Amen. Emily has a special song for us today. Do you want to tell us why you selected it? Um, it just really seemed to fit with your sermon series. And like I told you this morning, this was one I just literally found at random on YouTube one day. So that was very much a God find he brought into my life. And it just seems like a really good song for like when you need to like emotionally or anything like just kind of like round yourself back into that you know god is with you okay. i'm not sure what is happening oh here we go he got it <laughs> This torn up pages in this book Words that tell me I'm no good Chapters that define me for so long But the hands of grace and endless love Dusted off and picked me up Told my heart that hope is never gone God is in this story God is in the details, even in the broken parts, He holds my heart, He never fails. When I'm at my weakest, I will trust in Jesus, always in the highs and lows, the one who goes before me. God is in this story. So if the storm you're walking through feels like it's too much and you wonder if he even cares at all, hold on tight to what you know. He promised he won't let you go. The song of healing's written in his scar. God is in this story. God is in the details, even in the broken parts, He holds my heart, He never fails. When I'm at my weakest, I will trust in Jesus, always in the highs and lows, the one who goes before me. For the blessing, I forgot an important part that Mickey told me. She has extra hot dogs. <laughs> so if you'd like that. There's 22 hot dogs and a huge <laughs> amount of pasta salad. Okay. Yeah. 
So see my, uh, Mickey after <laughs> the service if you're in. <laughs> <laughs> They're already ready, yes. So as you go from this place, may the love of God embrace us. May the grace of Jesus challenge us. The power of the Holy Spirit renew us. And so peace before you, peace behind you, peace above you, peace beneath you, peace at your right, peace at your left, peace within and all around you, this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.